So uh, Hackers and Painters was started sometime this year um, by Kelvin Chang and a few others and uh, basically they wanted to have some kind of lunchtime talk to have, you know, and they, they understand a lot of people can't just go after work to some meeting and talk about technology and all these other cool stuff. So, um, so he felt like having a lunchtime thing would be better. It started first, of, first, of, first was started in Block 71, which is down at Ayi Raja Kassan. Uh, he, he asked me whether I could uh, help him host one in town. So, um, yeah, I said, yeah, we could. And my boss, Stephen Go was pretty uh, excited about letting us use the place. So, yeah. Um, it's his lunchtime thing, so it's okay to pack food and come here and have, have food here. Uh, yeah, I think that's the way that it works in Block 71. Uh, I think we can use the same practice here as well. So if you uh, don't, don't feel shy about eating and, and, and hearing this thing to us, just don't be too noisy when eating. And uh, Stephen just said, uh, try not to make a mess. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure we, we won't. Um, yeah, so today I'll be just talking a little bit about creating responsive websites. Um, right, so... Right, so first of all, uh, my name is Michael, Michael Cheng. I run the PHP user group, um, I'm, and I'm, I'm a senior software engineer in Community Tree. Uh, that's where we are now, the company guys are in. Uh, yeah, so... Um, building a responsive website, that's some of the best practices and a real case study about what we do in Make the Tree for our, our, for our site. Um, so, what, what do I mean by responsive, right? So, uh, being responsive, yeah, to me, I see there are, there are two, two definitions. One is how fast your website responds to user input, right? That's about website speed. Um, and the other one would be how well your website gracefully degrades uh, to different browsers and platforms, right? As in how, how it works from on a desktop to a tablet to a smartphone and then all the way down to a Nokia crappy feature phone, right? So, uh, so it's about how you, how you respond gracefully uh, from that to this. Um, so for the first part, about how fast the website responds to user input, uh, there's a lot of literature on the internet about how this is done. I, I, I recommend you go to this website uh, developed by Yahoo. Um, I'll, I'll upload this slide a bit later uh, so you guys can have a look at it. So basically that, that site has 30, 35 tips about how to actually optimize your website speed. Um, that, is, that part of it is pretty much covered elsewhere. So I'll cover more about how your web, website basically degrades into to the different platforms. So the first question, first question we'll ask is how far do you want to push this? Right? So basically who are you building for? Uh, what kind of browser support you want to achieve, right? In Meet 33, because we are, we, we are accessible from different parts of uh, the world and even in places where there are limited uh, internet access, so you need to be able to support a phone which is GPRS uh, and a feature phone like a Nokia N95 or a E73 or E72. E72. So, um, so uh, because we are a chat client, so we, we, we let you uh, basically chat with, with friends on, on, online uh, through the smartphones and feature phones. So which is why we need to be able to support different uh, browser sizes. And internally we have a matrix where we create uh, four, four grades, like grade A, B, C and D. Grade A support will be basically, actually I Scott stole this from uh, jQuery Mobile, because jQuery Mobile had, a, had also a grading system where they say how, what, what kind of browsers they can support. Um, so I'm kind of paraphrasing from there. So grade A will be a basically desktop browser. Basically a one, minimum 1280 by 800 or more uh, in terms of resolution, screen resolution. A tablet, would, uh, a tablet will be basically grade B support where we, I would say it's a tablet, like say iPad. Right? So basically how, how, well is, how well your web page can be viewed on an iPad, landscape or portrait. Right? Uh, and grade C would be smartphone support. So how do you, assist, how do you view it on a iPhone? Uh, and to a certain extent, even on E72, which is like a, a, a keyboard and, and, uh, and yeah. So that's the grade C support. Grade D, so grade D support would be for N95 phones, which is kind of like really crappy small screen. Like 320 width usually, 320 width, uh, pixels of width, higher. 
maybe three twenty, uh, three twenty, two forty by three twenty. I think some of them. So there, 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 there are some documents online about how I mean how well the screen sizes you can support, uh, and yeah. So that's the question about who will be who, who do you want? How far do you want to push this, right? I uh, see when you're building a website, mm -hmm. who are your target audience? For us in BKV, our target audience are all the whole spectrum, A to D, this whole group of people. Uh, so which is why we need to be able to uh, build a site which can be supported and built on these all these devices. Uh, so what's the stack? So we're building front end stuff, right? So we're building front end stuff. We will <coughs> probably try. We try to use the latest technology as far as we can. HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript, right? Um, and <coughs> As far as we can, we try to use the late, latest tags and whatnot, but there are some older browsers that don't support it. So you, you might have to be worried. You got to kind of be aware of the limitations of certain browsers, right? So like some browsers, if you give them the button tag, they don't know how to render it. Uh, some browsers, uh, fortunately, if you, uh, and the N95 phone actually does know how to render the button, so which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, CSS3, there are ways you can, well, a good thing is that like older browsers who don't understand CSS3 syntax usually will ignore it, uh, unless it's a non-standard browser which kind of dies when you see something it doesn't like, recognize. Uh, I've not actually seen any of those yet, so maybe those in China. <laughs> right, um, okay, semantic naming, basically, um, Personally, I prefer classes more than IDs because you have a CSS class, you have assign a class, you have style a class, you basically all the stuff uh, in the DOM kind of uh, uh, inherits the styling. An ID will more likely, if it's only one, you're, you're sure only one of these exists in the whole DOM, right? Otherwise, it's going to be crazy. Um, personally, I think frameworks are okay. Internally, uh, we ourselves we actually use some frameworks for our JS client, which is the our full web, web client where after users log in, we're using Backbone JS, uh, uh, we're using <coughs> Require JS and all these other cool, funky keywords. Um, yeah, but my responsibility in the company is more of the front end, what you see when you go to meetthe3.com, right? Uh, how many of you guys have actually visited the meetthe3.com website recently? Just today or yesterday? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'll show you guys later, don't worry. Yeah, because we, we actually finally just pushed a new version yesterday, so I'm kind of happy that we did. Okay, uh, what we do we use internally? Personally, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of CSS preprocessors. If you haven't started using this, uh, any form of preset preprocessors, please do. <laughs> Go ahead and try, and try something. There are a couple of these preprocessors out there. So basically, a, a CSS preprocessor means you, you write in a certain syntax and you, and you have a, a parser that will convert it into full, fully modified <coughs> CSS tags that browsers can, can understand. There are many benefits of using CSS, CSS uh, preprocessors. Uh, one would be you can do um, mix-ins. Mix-ins are kind of like, think of it as functions. You call a function, it will generate a whole bunch of uh, uh, CSS codes for you, right? And in, in when, you, when it gets generated. Um, variables, you have variables for, for colors. So you can set a blue color, add blue or something, yeah, a, a variable called blue color and you can mark, you can tag it to a, a, a hex, hexadecimal color, right? So, so that's some of the benefits of using preprocessor. Uh, CSS, uh, less, CS, uh, less is a CSS preprocessor which we use. Let me have a look, I'll show you how it looks like. Yeah, so this is the less CSS preprocessor. As you can see, you're basically writing in, you know, um, kind of CSS, kind of, it is CSS, right? But it's kind of, it allows it supports additional syntax for, for for indentation, which will then create uh, a nested CSS, um, and so on and so forth, right? So for example, something like this will generate to something like this. So you, have, you can you can mix in a variable called color, and then it will convert into this when it's generated when it's compiled, right? Um, using CSS on uh, less CSS on its own is pretty cool. But sometimes you might want to use some some uh, some um, frameworks that can help you. One of it, one which we use is uh, called CSS Less Elements, which are which is basically a collection of mixins they can use, right, to kind of quickly do like round corners, 
and stuff like round corners for and you, you throw in all the additional browse, mm -hmm. uh, browser specific uh, markups as well like uh, Moz and WebKit and all the other stuff. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. It's just one file that you import and you can do server-side kind of like uh, uh, in, in include on the on, in, in compile time, right? Um, yeah, and for templating, we use a thing called PHP Tau. If you're using PHP, because we use PHP, uh, um, you can use PHP Tau to do that. Uh, of course, if that's not your thing, you can go for Mustache, which is cool also, um, um, whichever. Uh, of course, for JavaScript, we use vanilla JS. You just plain JS. <laughs> it's a site. You can check it out later. Yeah. Um, Right, so let's get the nitty gritty, the best practices. Um, media queries are your friend. Media queries was introduced in CSS3 uh, to kind of help you detect what kind of browser, what kind of uh, your browser, what kind of properties that your browser window has, like what's the width, what's the minimum height, and all that stuff. And with that, you can then uh, try to adapt to the browser size. Mm. Yeah, so. For example, this is our, our website. So what I mean by a responsive website is something like this, right? So when you drag it and resize the window. So this is like a full full uh, web grade A support, grade B support, you know, grades, grade, grade B, grade C, and then all the way down. Yeah, so it, it gracefully degrades. Like for example, this section on fun, freedom, and friends, it kind of degrades and it kind of pops up with the full image when you get to a certain width. So yeah, it's pretty fast. Also. Uh, yeah, it's pretty fast to load. Uh, there's another one which is the learn more section. When you go inside there, you see a whole big chunk of stuff, right? Three three chunks of stuff and as we resize it right. so it kind of narrows down and only shows you the stuff that you need give it the footer it kind of resizes it itself you can see the blue the, this blue uh, and gray section so, uh, the, the kinds of switch to the arrow thingy and as you can see the bottom part it, it, it upgrades from one column to three column and then to the last one which has a very nice gray bottom so the way we the way we kind of move, get around uh, doing this is using media queries media query will basically tell me uh, or rather tell my code okay what's the minimum width and height of a page and with that, I can then apply a different style to it. And because it was using cascading style sheets, basically, if you declare something after the first declaration, the, sec the second declaration will actually overwrite the first declaration. Like uh, H1, we give it a font size 5, right? And then you have a done uh, declaration after that that kind of says, uh, I want to change H1 to font size 15, right? You actually, 15 will overwrite 5, right? So we're using this uh, inherent uh, um, capability of CSS to, to do responsive design. What we're doing then is actually we're, we're declaring a new style uh, attribute when browser window hits a certain size, right? So I can cash. So that's using that's media queries. Uh, let me just show you in code how this pretty much works. Like in the home page that you see, this is less, by the way. Uh, so we have on top, these are all the base, base styles that are applied to the different, uh, different objects in your DOM. But once the resolution hits a certain size, if you scroll, when I scroll down further, you should see it. Right. So media is of screen. You, 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 it's a screen that's viewing this, and it's minimum width of 500 pixels. This style, if, uh, for example, this style will overwrite the, the one that was declared previously, right? So I'll show it to you now how, how, it's, how it differs. 
So this style here, it says I want the height to be 470 pixels. The original declaration. Oh, it's also 470. Okay. Okay, okay for a uh, slogan, for example, slogan width is 90%, and the slogan here is set to auto. What this does that um, what this does is that the hero slogan, which is the first in the first page, which is this part, I think. Before pixel five hundred, it actually goes is flush to the edges. Once it hits five hundred pixels, okay, let's bring up my developer console so I can see the change in the resolution. You can see over there. The resolution change when it hits 500 pixels, a padding appears by the corner because I, I the, sec, the second style, the second style which, which is only applied after it reaches the 500 pixel mark, changes the, the width to 90 percent, right? So, so basically, you're having something below the overrides is what I was declared earlier, and the way to do that is using media queries, which is basically as simple as this. So you can set. Uh, minimum width, minimum height, maximum width, maximum height. Um, there is also there are a few other resolu other uh, attributes you can apply that would uh, control it. But m mostly for us, we use the width, basically because that is pretty much what what we we kind of know about different browsers. Like we kind of know the the the, the prevailing uh, screen sizes for different types of devices, right? So so what we do is we. Yeah, based on the screen width and height, uh, we will apply the different styles. Um, so that's using media query. So resolution, and the, 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 there's no fixed guideline to how much res resolution uh, that will be used, right? Although we know the screen sizes, but the resolution that you target uh, will vary based on your design. In our design for the new site, um, a lot of the design elements are flushed all the way to the edge. For example, over here, this blue bleeds, this blue uh, better bleeds beyond the margin, right? So we need to then have a style that would be fully 100%, but at the same time, have, have, have a capability to control it to a certain margin in width. So uh, your, de your design will actually determine how, uh, which resolution to target for. In our case, we, let me just show you what we use. So as you can see, we use uh, 500 pixels as the first layer of transition. The second layer of transition is 785 pixels. Beyond that is, I, I remember correctly, is 930 pixels. Somewhere below. 930 pixels, and then the rest is, is wider, is 1020 pixels. So as a guideline, I will talk, I say there are four grades, A, B, C, and D. So all these, these are the major like platforms and guidelines of screen resolution you should target for. But based on your design, you might want to be able to transit in more in more than four phases, right? Um, for example, over here, uh, because because of this little little uh, rotating banner and and make bot in the middle, uh, I had to do something to hide it, right? For example, I can first resize it and then hide it all together. Because if I go a bit too far, it will overlap with other elements and look ugly. Right? So I want to be able to do that gracefully. So the resolution you target for, uh, is a lot of, will be based on your design. And the best way to do it is to basically have the design ready and kind of... Okay, what I, my, the strategy that we used was to basically ask our product manager, Look, I'm going to resize this screen, right? What are the things that are most important to you? Right? What do you want to see when you hit all the way to this resolution, right? And our product manager kind of told us, look, I want to see this, and I want to see this, the call to action. These are two most important elements on the screen. So, okay. So how do we gracefully degrade from this all the way down to this, right? So I asked him, was this, is this piece of information important? And he said, no. The more important stuff is this slogan and this call to action, right? So we kind of like decided based on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so and the other strategy that we use is to build for the smallest device first. Why? Any 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 guess why we build for the smallest device first? Any guess? 
that's where all the important elements are presented. Uh, yes, that's that too. Uh, well, it's easy to go up and to go down. Yeah, correct. So basically, what we also want to do is optimize the download speed, download size of the page, right? So basically, what we do is that the small in uh, because of the way that cascading style sheet works, the first declared style gets used first, right? And in a browser that doesn't support CSS3, we will ignore all the media queries. When we have a media query tag, and your browser is an old browser that doesn't understand what media query is, you will basically ignore that section. So what happened, this particular section, for example, on media, media screen and with this one, some older browsers like Internet Explorer 6, 7, 8, maybe 9, I don't know, don't really understand what media query is, right? So if you declare this, you would basically ignore it, uh, which is good because on older, on older browsers, you want them to be able to still see what you have. Sorry, but yeah. when, you, when you say ignore, is it just going to ignore the media query, the sentence, or it's going to ignore everything within the media query? It will ignore everything. Right. So, so basically, what uh, my st our strategy is to basically load up the minimum uh, graphics without media queries. So basically, without any media query declaration tag, we, we load up what you want to see on the smallest browser, right? And then we add another media query tag, or rather, we add the first media query tag, will be which will be the first step up, right? And that will basically include additional assets, different sizes of, of, uh, of, your, of your assets. Like this button is now 700 pixels instead of 20 pixels, right? Something like that. Um, then you step up further. And in doing that, you actually load, you only load the bigger assets when you reach the highest resolution, right? And in most cases, for example, if you look at uh, our, our, our browser, or rather the outside, the background actually is over up to 600 pixel mark. Our background is actually a smaller, a smaller image. And once it hits, I think the 700 megapixel mark, it actually loads a newer, a, a different image. I think it's more obvious if I show you the, the developer console. You bring up the network. Let me just start by just resizing it to the smallest resolution possible. Clear all this yeah. and do a hard refresh. Right, so that's all that's loaded. As you can see, it's only 265 uh, kilobytes transferred, so which is kind of small. And when I resi start resizing it, it will, should start loading more stuff. Ah, there you go. The rest of the assets gets loaded. Right. Like what we see in the back, this little uh, banner here, which has all the numbers, gets loaded only a bit later. As you can see, the last part, this little image hasn't been loaded yet. So when I resize it a bit further, it ought to load the, uh, the last few assets. So let me just resize it a bit more. There you go. It loads the additional assets. And with media query, you can also do like uh, retina display friendly images as well. So, for example, our logo. Let me just show you the logo, right? Here, which is a standalone logo. If you go further down, here we go. WebKit minimum pixel re uh, resolute ratio. This will basically tell me this. Uh, you will tell, okay, once the browser kind of tells me that it is a retina display for iPad, uh, iPad 3 uh, and above, or an iPhone 4 and above, it will then load this asset instead. Right? So, which is why you can, if you load our website on a on a uh, uh, retina screen display like uh, iPhone 4 or 5 or something, you see the logo is very sharp, right? Um, yeah, so of course the size of the file also increases. So 
be careful with that. There are some tips online that shows you how to actually do this, so I kind of like adopted those tips. Um, so basically, it's about taking the image and kind of giving it a uh, kind of a big, uh, actually two X image and kind of resize it to the actual size of the logo. Right. So um, yeah. So um, so this what what was. Where we're talking about building from the smallest device first, then layering it up. Right. Uh, sometimes it's not easy. To be honest, this is not easy for me. I because uh, we, I didn't have a good idea of how to how this could gracefully de degrade from big to small. So I do work backwards. I will get the full size image out first, full size side up first. Then I slowly consider what the stuff I need to pick and choose and move it around. So. Um, if you have if you or, or have already a mature site a site which is already built up, this is probably the strategy we we'll go for. So basically, what I did was okay. So this is the default styles, and then say okay. Now I need to do a bit. I need to do something to the logo, right? So for the logo, okay. This is the header. This is the logo. Da da da. Okay. Now I need to make this logo smaller or something. So what I do is that I'll create a new block and then copy the style down to the new block and then eliminate stuff which are kind of not meant to be there, right? So eventually I say the logo will be a bigger size when it hits, the, hits a certain resolution. Then I'll go down and just edit the size in the newer section. But then, uh, and then I'll yeah, then start the duplicate between the first section and uh, first declaration and second declaration. Start their duplicate. Like I probably made a mistake there with the, with the height, four seventy pixels. Should we remove? We should remove them, right? Um, yeah. So basically, you only leave in things that are overwriting the older style, uh, which are relevant only for the extreme resolution. Okay. This takes a bit of experimentation to find out what 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 you should use. In our own experimentation, we, we decided that minimum width, min, min width is kind of like the best way to go. In our previous version, in the previous version of our website, um, I even had to play around with, with the height. Sorry, I would play around with the height because uh, in great uh, the smartphones, smartphone browsers, right? Uh, if you look at just iPhone four and five, um, it's a fairly straightforward resolution. You look at a HTC butterfly or something which has a white screen and taller and taller screen, uh, the, the width setting of 320 may not be relevant. Right? So it was a little bit of uh, playing around with the resolution until you get it right. So best is you get an actual device to test with, or you can find the resolutions the actual resolution online, load it up. Uh, pers I, personally I have this little widget here, uh, which kind of lets me play around with the resolutions and stuff. So in Chrome, uh, um, I'm sure it's in, 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 uh, in Firefox or something similar, you can just specify a resolution. Yeah. Right, um, so uh, in building from the smallest device up, only load the assets that you need in the smallest version. So basically in the, in the un, un, un media query section, you load the base stuff and only the assets that you need. So you only load, so you, you optimize the download speed on a small uh, device, right? As the screen goes bigger and whatnot, then you then you load more assets, and we should overwrite the new asset. Uh, I think there's a rule of thumb: if you're using a bigger screen size, chances are you're probably using a faster internet. <laughs> That's the conventional wisdom, right? So, yeah. Um, okay. So styling attack. So basically, if you can style attack instead of adding a div with the class, right? I think there's an old saying in, in, the, in the web development world, there's a thing called the div itis and class itis. Like, solve it with throwing, slapping a div there and putting a class to it, and slapping a, you know. So, as much as you can, style attack, right? And it also makes your markup a, little, a bit more readable. Um, how do I mean by this? Let's have a look at, say, um, Let's see where I can load it up. Um, <coughs> see some of the templates. <coughs> I think it's better to show the, the actual rendering. Okay. Yeah, 
you for this. Right, so in the case of the slogan, okay, maybe not this, okay, now. Okay, the, the slogan, for example, first started with a div with a class slogan and as a H1 and a P. So as you can, as much as you can, just style the H1 and the P, right? So because you basically take on the class as the main identifier and then kind of style the style the tag underneath it. Um, let me try and load up that section there again and show you better. Oh wait, I should show you the style for that. Um, Oh, it's a whole base, base. Yeah. No, it's whole. Yeah. Sure, there you go. So, right, so you, based on this, you only style the H1 and you style the P. Right? Uh, so, that right? it's already part of the DOM, right? Instead of, why we sometimes people do in the past is that they yeah. have a div with another H1 and then the H1 has a class and then so on and so forth and then they try to style the class instead of something else. Which is only relevant if, yeah. The, other, the, the reason they do that is another school of thought is because your, your, your style is their markup dependent. So you can change your markup, but if you, if you use class size, it doesn't really matter because your class yeah. is still there. Which is why it only matters if you foresee yourself recycling or reusing that style in other parts of the system, right? It only matters to do like, um, like instead of H1, you start to like class uh, H1 or something like that. Um, yeah, it only matters if you want to recycle this or reuse this in other, in other parts of the system. Um, personally, I don't really do that, so I just keep it to just a tag. It makes the markup a bit cleaner. Um, of course, the reason why my markup is a bit dirty now is because I have an ID inside. So the ID is meant for me to target the, <coughs> the slogan and change it and rotate it. Okay, never mind that. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So as much as you can, style tag unless you want to recycle uh, that class elsewhere. Um, uh, the browser developer tool is your best friend, right? So if you have, you're using Chrome or Firefox uh, they have, and, and Safari, there's a whole bunch of developer tools they can use, they can bring up, they can help you find stuff, target certain layer, even even experiment with styles. Like you can go in and say, okay, I, I, instead of being one, let's see this. So for example, I can just select here, right click and say, look, this is this. this, is this. I don't want this to be so big, I want it to be smaller. Let's see what happens when I make it smaller. Okay, there's, there's some bug here. Some <laughs> Chrome has this. Sometimes Chrome has a bug that kind of this doesn't like to change. But usually, if you change it, it, will, it should apply. Yeah. yeah, it's a Chrome issue. Yeah, uh, there are similar things that are available in. Uh, in Firefox, uh, like in Firefox, there is there's now a built-in developer tool. Uh, previously, we used Firebug, which kind of gives me the same kind of uh, uh, impact. Right. So use that to kind of test around with, with style. Sometimes when I finish doing, I implement an initial style, or rather, okay, when I was doing the learn more page, for example, or when I was at this page, right? So when I was going from this to this, I was kind of experimenting with the height. I wasn't sure how much height I should give this padding here, so I use, I bring up the style editor. And kind of, I tried increasing this, the height. Let me see if I can get the height here. So it sort of work. You know. So you can play around the height until you reach uh, the one you want. It's kind of like to quickly prototype. I know this is way too much. Um, bring it to, okay, roughly around here. So it's about 560, 550 pixels. Oh, sorry, 550 pixels would be the roughly the right one. 540 five, maybe, yeah. Okay, that looks right. 
So what I do is I take this number and update my style sheet. Right? So this is how I cut the sheet. Okay, uh, as much as you can, minify your, uh, your assets, your JavaScript and CSS. I think that's pretty much um, um, natural, doesn't it? Isn't it? Updating. Yeah, so if you can use the use tool, uh, where I use less, uh, I have a tool called less. It's a desktop software <coughs> that basically takes my less file and generates it into the CSS file and, and minifies it somehow, so which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. HV Storm also has its own uh, uh, compiler. I don't think it does any minification. Uh, you, you, want to be more, you want to go a bit more hardcore, you should consider a, a tool called Grunt. Grunt.js. Grunt.js is a build tool which has many different types of tasks. Um, and one of the tasks that you can apply is a CSS minification or JavaScript minification or uglify your JavaScript and stuff. So, yeah, this is a pretty cool, pretty cool to have. Um, if you are, you have a tool chain that, that uh, if you have a development, um, 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 you, have, you have a development um, 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 process that that support it. It's great. Um, if not, then you just manually run it before you check in a code. Yeah. Okay. Um, you are. This, this part about CDN is also covered in the Yahoo article. So use CDN to distribute static assets as much as you can. Um, and the last part will be the CSS3 transitions. CSS3 transitions is pretty new. Uh, I wouldn't say new, like, just been, it's just hard. It's, it's only, it came about with newer browsers. Like. Um, what CSS3 transitions it means is in uh, when a div or an element in your DOM gets changed, some, some property gets changed, you can actually um, slowly transit from say 100 pixel width to 50 pixel width and at what timing you can specify and how, and how smooth the animation will, could be. Right? So you, you basically can tell it to, okay, when the width uh, changed, when there's change in the width, right? Uh, you should do that. You should animate it from this to this at a certain speed, uh, through a process, uh, it's a duration of one second or two seconds or something, right? Um, so in, in our website, we actually use that uh, quite quite recently. So when you resize it, it kind of is a dot point two second uh, animation. It kind of rotates it <coughs> back and forth. It kind of moves it from that to this. Um, even on our home page, because we, we recycle, or rather we, I, we, we apply the transition, yes? Um, but for a user point of view, the main time they'll see that is on a mobile device when they switch orientation at the main time. Yeah. Because the normal areas won't resize the browser. Well, you can also do things like on the hover, on the hover or on scroll, right? You can okay. actually then yeah. also do the count. Uh, uh, you can also apply transitions to yeah. And I saw you had like a global style, you just applied it to all views, right? Yeah. So, because I'm a bit lazy. <laughs> no, mainly because I, I, I was doing, I kind of like, okay, yeah, it seems like a cool thing to have, let's try it. <laughs> so I applied all divs. So this in this case, uh, I applied all divs, it was a, well, I applied all properties. So you could, you could specify uh, when there's a change in width, or when you only apply when there's a change in height, or when there's a change in orientation, like say when you're rotating. You can actually do that as well. Uh, but I apply, I apply to all. So whenever there's a change in, in height, width, transparency, and all that shit, you will actually apply this. Uh, and over a 0.2 second uh, um, speed, animation is linear. I think it's, it's in terms of how, how, how smooth it goes. It's like either fast and slow, or slow and fast. But I choose linear because I want it to be even. Um, yeah, you got to do a bit of experimentation. I was working, I would play around with one second timing and uh, half a second timing, but the kind of 2.2 was kind of like the, the sweet spot <laughs> where it doesn't get too too jarring in terms of animation. Um, yeah, but there were some weird and quirky uh, behaviors that, that kind of came out of this. So for example, this little arrow here, because I applied the style to, to uh, I gave it a background, 
color or, of some sort in, in the second div. So when we size a certain size of here <coughs> to here, you can still see it a little bit. You can see the blue, the blue black ground color bleeds into this. Do you see it? The and blue background color. <coughs> yeah, as it stretches, like because it was resizing the div at the same time. So I had to mm -hmm. go in and override that style and, and turn off animation. It was used to be worse. It used to be like bump and slowly. You can still see a blue for like it was irritating. So <laughs> yeah, so there were some quirks that kind of happened. Uh, well, I guess this, there's a cause of actually me applying it throughout the whole system, so that's kind of, yeah. If I was a little bit <coughs> more smarter, I would, then, I would just go in and apply with the specific elements that needs it. Um, I have a feeling transitions like this are not cheap in terms of the CPU, in terms of uh, the browser rendering. Um, so I would, I would play with this judiciously, right? It's cool, it's look, it looks nice because, you know, in the past, I don't know where it is, where it is. We have our old site here. The, uh, clock. Can you see, see it here? Ah, okay. The old, this is our, our old website. You can see it kind of jumps abruptly from one to the other, which is kind of okay, but you know, but, you, know you want to have something cool that can amaze people, right? Uh, uh, amaze uh, bosses and, and investors and clients. <laughs> yeah. But one of the little um, kind of side effect of CSS transitions is, is this little thingy. You see it? It wasn't supposed to animate, but somehow it is doing it now. <laughs> so there's one of those little unforeseen side effects, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> I thought it was on purpose. No! <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of cool, it kind of works, oh, it kind of, yeah. But you get what I mean, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I think. Oh, it actually fades in now, huh? It used to be a, a rough flip over. No, I don't know. Crossfade. Yeah, so CSS tree transitions are cool, but use it judiciously because if it's too overloaded in some older browsers, I'm not sure how, how that would actually perform on a slower computer. So you might want to be judicious about it. Right. Um, actually don't, there's not much demo because I already I've been showing you code throughout the whole thing, right? So yeah. Um, that's all I have to share. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Yes. I've got two questions. Yeah. So the first one is, um, so you said like uh, the media queries, so you put the, you know, you're grading A, B, C, and D, right? You put the D all the way at the top. Yes. So, so meaning that uh, if you're loading on a browser, say like Internet Explorer, does that mean that you, the person using Internet Explorer is going to see like the mobile version of the site? So how do you deal with that? We don't. <laughs> Upgrade your browser. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if we, are, if, we are, if we are really particular about it, uh, if they really want to support older browsers like IE 7, 8, or 9, then you might want to have some user agent uh, detection and then show them the full version of the, of the, of the thing um, because they don't support media queries. So. Can you do the respond.js? Sorry? Respond.js. Respond so, yeah, another way would be to use a JavaScript. Solution that uh, some form of JavaScript that uh, <coughs> you, they could then help you apply the right styles. Uh, I'm not a big fan of using too too many too much JavaScript to do stuff. You know. um, My second question is: uh, uh, Do you have any uh, tips to people, the designers, people who are actually designing websites? You know, uh, what kind of uh, best practices do you have for them when it comes to you know we're going to come up with a design and we want to think responsibly as well. You know, when you're on the whiteboard, you're in the drawing board. Um, I think there's no two way around it. You just have to start drawing in smaller boxes. Big box, small box, smaller box. How does it, how does the wireframe <coughs> lay out? I think it starts at the wireframe level. When you do start doing the wireframe, you have to think about, okay, if a mobile user uses this, what are the most important elements do you want to show? And model that. And the biggest would be the, on the desktop browser, what other stuff you want to show, model that, and then how, how do we find the middle ground between that and this, right? 
I think it's no two way around that. You just if you really want to be serious about being well planned uh, in doing this, is you basically have to plan it beforehand. Like say from you know that on a desktop browser you can support three columns of text, but on a mobile browser you can only support one column. How do you go about doing this? Right? Like in our learn more page. Um, in our case, we didn't have much. We didn't have the luxury of time, so. The designer came up with just the full the full version, right? So I, I kind of told the designer, look, I, I just need you to give me the assets I need. I need you to give me a smaller version of the background banner, right? Which means I will I, I won't be loading a full background banner when I when I get to the smallest device. Uh, so I told her, give me one with the width of six hundred pixels, right? And then I'll, I'll do I'll handle the rest, right? So in this case, it was has uh, then this has a transition transit from a two column which is text on the left, graphic on the right, and translate into a one column thing. What if I'm really, I'm smarter about it, I could have then, I could, I could actually, in the interim phase, load this into the, the social and fun box if I want to. So it becomes like part of uh, the, the, the whole section instead of it being, being another couple, another row. Um, if I'm smart about it, but then I'm not sure how, how that would affect my markup going forward. Uh, and design and color, color schemes and whatnot. As you can see, actually, the, the, the image also resizes when it gets to the small, smaller one. And I basically used the 2x version of this image, right? So this image is a 1x, so when I go to this, you hit, you will load the 2x version, and then you will count up. Yeah. So the good thing about doing this is that at this stage, the smallest level, I also declare a 2x version of the image. So if you load it on the retina screen, you will see a very high definition, well, high quality version of the report. Which is kind of fun. Um, if I got if I got a bit further, I would even done a 3x version, which will then, when I'm here doing this on the iPad uh, Air, I could then load the highest resolution version of this image. So it can be done. Um, yeah, I haven't done that yet. But, but optimizing for smaller screen sizes, but yeah. Um, no two way around it. You just need to do that. Come up with I think the two extremes, right? Basically the the desktop version and the smallest resolution version, and then find finding a way to kind of bridge the gap. To to uh, starting at a wireframe level would be very good because that will help you visualize and uh, even rationalize. I like say in the, on the desk, big desktop version, you have a whole bunch of things on the screen ha happening at the same time. So we get a smaller screen. You only want to focus on the things that uh, the user wants to. That you want to focus on things that you will catch the user's attention in the first. We're in the first two scrolls, right? Because you put it too far, far down the down the full, they will never get to it. Which, although chances are on a mobile browser, on a touch screen browser, you can just scroll all the way if you want. It's kind of but not too much You can scroll up, but not too much. <laughs> okay. Um, Any other questions? Right. Uh, without any questions, you can uh, just check out the, our website, the Hackers and Painters website. I think there's also an actual website that, that Calvin prepared. So you can check it out. Um, there's another talk here again next week. If I Let me try and pull up the event. Um, that search thingy right now. Should be a search engine thing, yeah, how I got my site to top 100 without top results with no budget, okay, so that's something else, so uh, that's the next, that's for next week, um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other talks going on, so uh, yeah, if you can make it, do come, <laughs> if you can't, you know, it's cool, we will, we, I'll try to put the videos up, um, I'm actually recording today's session, so uh, I'll be putting up the, the all that together with the links. Um, you probably get you probably find it on the on the hackers and business website uh, soon. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, uh, bit of logistics. So if you can come, uh, you, you can bring a lunch here, don't worry. Just bring a lunch here. Uh, there's water, um, there's, there's cold water and hot water and a little bit of <laughs> coffee. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is Big 33, it's my office where I work in, so um, yeah, I mean, 
you know, feel free to come by and say say hi and chat. So, um, yeah, not too often though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never get old then. <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, I also have members of our, my, my web, uh, our web team here, and uh, my hair engineering is here. Uh, we're, we're actually hiring, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, so hiring web developers. So if you're interested uh, and you love the view <laughs> and the environment, um, you can give us a thing. Free coke and uh, free coke in the fridge. Uh, free coke in the fridge. <laughs> Take advantage of it quick, quick. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.